10 years was a long time to bear a grudge. But Clytemnestra never wavered. Her fury neither waxed nor waned. It burned a constant heat. She could warm her hands on it when the nights were cold and use it to light her way when the palace was in darkness. She would never forgive Agamemnon for murdering her eldest child, Iphigenia, nor for the thuggish deceit of his wife and daughter with talk of a wedding. So all that was left to think about was how she would take her revenge upon him and how she could persuade the gods to sanction her actions. She was sure that Artemis was her ally because everything had been caused by Agamemnon's affront to the goddess all those years ago at Aulis. The slaughter of Iphigenia had been the priest's idea to win Artemis back to the Argive cause and give them a fair wind to Troy. But if the goddess had been angry with Agamemnon once, she would be angry with him again. If anyone knew that, it was his wife. Clytemnestra did not set out to murder him at first. For a year or two, she prayed daily that he would be killed in the war. And she prayed that his death would be ignominious that he would not die to the tro on the Trojan battlefield, which was hardly likely given his tendency to sulk behind his men, but be stabbed in the night by someone he knew and trusted. Yet the years came and went, and still he lived. Once five years had passed, she decided on a new strategy. Every day he was not killed was a day she spent planning how she would kill him on his return to Mycenae. Her plan was complex and she luxuriated in it. She would wake up at first light and stretch out in it, considering all its angles and corners until she was fully satisfied. She needed to be in a perpetual state of readiness because who knew when the endless war would end and she needed the revenge to be apt killing him would not be sufficient to repay him for the horror of what he had done the first step was to send a messenger a messenger to Aegisthus Agamemnon's cousin and bitter enemy inviting him to the royal house of Mycenae it was a drawn out process and it was some months before he could be persuaded that it was not a trap. Her own servants were aghast that she should make any contact with the son of Thyestes. But Clytemnester did not require their approval or their understanding of her actions. In fact, she was relying on the opposite. She was resourceful and she was persistent and eventually Aegisthus arrived in Mycenae, attended by his guards. Slaves ran through the lofty halls of the palace to find their mistress and tell her that the great enemy of the royal household was outside claiming an audience. They were startled when she rose from her seat and strode towards the palace gates to greet the man, chiding them for the abuse of guest host friendship because they'd left four armed men outside the halls instead of making them welcome. Clytemnestra had never met Aegisthus before. The family enmity was an old one. And she was surprised to see so little resemblance between the cousins. He had the same womanish mouth as Agamemnon, a man she could no longer think of as her husband, but only as her enemy. His hair sprang back from a similar point in the middle of his brow. But I guess this was younger and taller and willowy. His expression was uncertain, uh, as if he were nervous but trying to disguise it. She wondered if he'd ever wielded a sword in battle. 
she did not wonder for long. She saw him before he saw her, noticed him staring around at the great height of the citadel, gawping at the pair of stone lions which topped the gates through which he had walked to reach her. He was not intimidated, she thought, but he was certainly impressed. Her slaves opened the doors and she walked outside, tall and assured. She saw his expression shift, nervous, but also stricken with unexpected desire. Cousin, she said, bowing low before him. Please, um, come inside. She appeared slightly flustered, although she was not. I am sorrier than I can say that my slaves have left you standing out here while they went to fetch me. The discourtesy shall not go unpunished. I will have them all flogged. I guess this face shifted again into an eager smile. It is no matter, madam. The wait was brief and gave us a moment to enjoy the magnificent view. He gestured behind him to the mountains fading into the blue distance. Mycenae nestled in an unparalleled location. Clytemnestra's land stretching out on all sides around it. It would be, she'd often thought, easy to defend. You're too kind, cousin, she said, straightening to her full height. Please don't have the slaves flogged on my account. It is not necessary. She watched him, believing that he was being magnanimous, and she saw the extra confidence it gave him. This was going to be very easy. I will do anything you say, she replied. You are my honoured guest. Will you come indoors and let us offer you refreshment? It would be an honour. The honour is all mine, she said. Would your men care to join us? Or would you prefer to dine alone? I guess those bodyguards were too well trained to show their surprise. A married woman, a queen, offering to dine alone with a man she had never previously met. This was hardly customary behaviour. Still, one of them shrugged. Who knew what sort of things happened in Mycenae? My men will dine with your servants, if that is acceptable to you, Aegisthus said. Clytemnestra nodded and gestured to her slaves. Feed these men, they've had a long journey, she said. Not long in distance, I know, but it has been so many years since our halves of the family were united that it must have felt like an endless road to get here. She reached out to Aegisthus and took his hands in hers. This is our chance to make old wrongs right, she said. And she pulled him slightly towards her, almost taking him off balance. Come with me. We will begin our friendship with wine. And she laced her arm through the arm of a stranger and steered him along the corridors of her palace. They both realised that the length of their stride, he in his travelling tunic, she in her long, fluid dress, was identical. She pointed out to him the beautiful tapestries in finest, darkest purple that hung along the walls. He could see how wealthy she was, even without having his attention drawn to the most opulent of the work. But as she gazed at the knots of thread which made the intricate pattern so lovely and so precise, she had the unshakable sense that a new fabric was being woven by her and the knots in her tapestry, once tied, would prove impossible to undo. She gave a delighted shiver and squeezed Aegisthus' arm more tightly. Seducing him was the easiest pleasure she could remember. He was so keen to be liked and so desperate to be told what to do. 
she loved his young skin, his lithe limbs, his narrow waist. She loved him in the dark hours of the night and she loved him more when the morning sun bathed his skin and turned him into gold. Sometimes she had to remind herself that she had a greater ambition in mind than an adulterous relationship with her husband's sworn enemy. But she never forgot for more than a moment, no matter how distracting he was. His devotion, once earned, was not easily lost. He had an almost dog-like character. It was all she could do to stop him from following her around the palace. He loathed Agamemnon at least as much as she did, which meant they always found something to talk about. He also loathed any reminder that her life had existed before he entered it, despising Orestes and Electra equally. The two boys, she found it hard not to think of Aegisthus in this way, almost came to blows several times and so she sent Orestes away to live with a distant cousin. She wanted to keep him safe and it was the only way she knew. She had no doubt that otherwise Aegisthus would kill him before long and Orestes had not yet proven himself to be much of a warrior. He was his father's son in this regard, she thought. She enjoyed the way her lover was quick to anger, but never with her. Clytemnestra would have had little to complain of if she had not also been the mother of daughters. The ghost of Iphigenia was never far away. She felt her daughter's breath on her neck sometimes. She had brought Iphigenia back from Aulis to Mycenae, buried her at the closest priest-sanctioned place she could, although why she should ever listen to a priest again after what one of them had taken from her, she had no idea. She made offerings of a lock of her hair every year on the day of Iphigenia's death but her daughter could not rest, unavenged as she was. And each year Clytemnestra would bow before her tomb and promise that she would punish the man who had sired her and killed her. But the war dragged on and she could not make good on her promise. So Iphigenia never truly left her. She was also haunted by Electra. Daily, she wished it had been Electra who was sacrificed by Agamemnon rather than Iphigenia for reasons which were unclear to Clytemnestra. Her surviving daughter idolized her absent father, seemingly unconcerned that he had sliced open the throat of her sister for the sake of a following wind. If it was the God's will, she once said when Clytemnestra asked, begged really, to know how she could have so little care for a sister. Of course, Electra had been too young to know Iphigenia, too young to know her father either. Of course he had. Any god would be offended that such an oaf walked in the light. Never mind, be a king. They had punished him at Aulis rightly for his hubris but she had no belief that they had wanted the price to be paid by her beloved daughter. Why should they? Iphigenia was just a child. And the murder had been... She hesitated in her mind to find the appropriate phrase. So dishonest. To kill a girl a daughter was bad enough. But to do so in a ritual which had made a mockery of her youth, of her maidenhead, a false marriage. Had any mother ever suffered something more vicious or cruel to dress the girl up, promise her a great warrior to be her husband and then to cut her down? At the very least, she knew her husband had earned the enmity of Achilles for dragging his name into the whole disgusting affair. What Greek 
prince could be anything other than appalled to see his name used as a trap for a defenseless girl. Agamemnon might be so shameless that he could stoop to this, but other men had higher standards. Clytemnestra knew who to pray to, and she prayed to them all. To Artemis, against whom the original outrage had been levelled. To Hymenaeus, the god of marriage, whose institution had been so affronted by this despicable crime. Then she prayed to Night, who would conceal her plans for vengeance. Lastly, she prayed to the Furies, who would accompany her as she worked their will. And all the while, she sent scouts in every direction across the mainland to bring her news of Troy. Nine years after Iphigenia had been slaughtered like an animal, Clytemnestra sent her watchmen out for the last time. Don't come back, she told each man, unless you bring me news of his return and send a message here every 10 days so I know you're alive and watching. She knew they complained about their postings, these men sent from the fine city of Mycenae to wait on the clifftops and demand news of any travellers coming into any port from the east, but she did not care. And after a year, a whole year of waiting, the message finally came back. It came in the form of fire, like her fury. Her watchmen lit beacons on the top of each mountain, one after another, and the news reached her before it reached any other Greek city. She sent her most trusted slaves to find out more. They returned on foot, having ridden their horses to exhaustion. The Argive ships had left Troy, the slaves reported. The city was in ruins, its temples had been overturned and emptied. Its wealth had been spread among the Greeks, its towers had fallen, its horse-taming men were killed, its women enslaved. Agamemnon long-lost king of Mycenae, was returning home in his ship laden with treasure and concubines. She had only days to prepare a fit welcome for her husband. Clytemnestra greeted this news quietly. She was ready. First, she explained to Aegisthus one more time why he must hide when Agamemnon returned. He must hide and perform a vital task to keep Electra from speaking to her father, lest he give away their plan before the time was right. Aegisthus was such an impetuous boy, he would have rushed at the king with a sword as he stood on the palace steps if she'd let him. He could not see, until she explained it, how this would lead to an uprising from the Mycenaeans. There was little affection for their absent king in the city, but not so little that she could afford to kill an unarmed man on his return from war. Especially if he brought wealth to spread among his people. Although, privately, Clytemnestra scoffed at the very idea that Agamemnon would share anything with anyone, even his wife. What should I do with Electra? Aegisthus asked. She will not come anywhere with me if I ask her. Clytemnestra shrugged. Gag her! Throw her in the storerooms if that's what it takes to keep her out of the way. Electra had performed a sacrifice of thanksgiving when she heard her father was returning at last, and the queen was not in a forgiving mood. Did I tell you they overturned the Trojan temples? I guess this nodded, but his interest was not caught by this part of the tale. He cared far less than his lover did about the endorsement of the gods. His father had taught him when he was young that the gods' approval mattered very little compared to man's will. But Clytemnestra relished this news above all. Of course, Agamemnon's men had assaulted the temples and the priests. If the rumours she heard were correct, they had not even respected Priam's pleas for sanctuary as he cowered at the altar of Zeus himself. She shook her head, astonished that even men who answered to Agamemnon could have such little respect for the king of the gods. 
And then there was the second rumour, which filled her with white rage and delight in equal measure that the concubine Agamemnon was bringing home to Greece was a priestess of Apollo. The arrogance made her catch her breath. To take a priestess whose body was sacrosanct to the archer and to use her as his whore. Now it was not just Artemis whose support Clytemnestra could count on, Apollo would be on her side too. She counted the days of Agamemnon's voyage across the water and she told her watchmen to come home. She needed no further confirmation of the rumours. She would know soon enough who travelled with the once king of Mycenae. She readied herself for his return. A small lion place about her son Orestes. Electra, out of the way. She looked into her dark mirror and she admired her strong jaw. She should try to conceal the lean, hungry expression which had come upon her eyes over the past 10 years. She wondered how those years had affected her sister, Helen. Was she still so beautiful that men wept merely to see her? She rolled her eyes in remembered irritation. She probably was. She summoned her maidservants and had them plait her hair into neat braids. When she was with Aegisthus, she'd grown into the habit of wearing it loose to reflect his age rather than her own. But as matron queen welcoming her adventuring husband, she needed to present a different appearance. As she admired her own long neck, less swan-like than Helen's, no doubt, but even so, she realised that she was looking forward to the day ahead. She had planned for it for so long, and now she had the twin pleasures, not just of enacting her revenge after such a long delay, but also of seeing her plan come to fruition. Clytemnestra sensed him before she heard the stamp of men's boots on hard rocks. She would have known even without her watchmen and their beacons of rage, that Agamemnon was nearby. The birds still sang, the cicadas still buzzed, the breeze still moved the dry yellowing grasses around her palace, but she knew something had changed. She could feel the heat glowing inside her. She took a breath and held it, closed her eyes for a moment. She gave the word to her slaves, and they ran to do her rehearsed bidding. The tapestries came down off the walls and were carried to the front gates of the palace. The slaves stood in fours, each holding a corner of the dark purple cloth, which seemed to glisten in the unaccustomed sunlight. The day was hot and dry, the breeze bringing none of the cool sea air up to her citadel. She could taste the dust kicked up by the feet of the soldiers who were marching from their ship to their home. The path curved up the hill from the shore, so they heard the men before they saw them. When they came around the final corner, she had her slaves perform obeisance and she herself bowed low. She held the pose for a moment before straightening her back to see her husband for the first time since their eyes met across the body of their dead daughter in Aulis 10 years earlier. How small he seemed. Her memory had made him taller, she supposed. And if the years had made her leaner, they had made him greyer. And paunchy. She wondered how a man could get fat during a war. He was red-faced, sweating in his ludicrous regalia. What kind of a man wore a bronze breastplate and a plumed helmet to return home? 
one who believed his power was seated in his costume, she supposed. The red leather of his scabbard was very fine, studded with gold flecks. She did not recognise it. She realised this must be part of his share of the fabled wealth of Troy. To have killed her child for a decorated bit of animal skin. She could feel the contempt shaping her mouth into a sneer and she stopped herself. Now was not the time to lose control. That would come later. The Argive men had not escaped the war without casualties. She tried to calculate how many men Agamemnon had lost. A quarter? A third? Some had died noble deaths on the battlefield, she knew. They had been interred by their comrades, their armour shared out among those to whom it could still do some good. Some had died of disease, a plague incurred by Agamemnon, of course. With his refusal to respect a priest of Apollo, she had laughed when she heard about that plague, laughed until her face hurt in bed with Agithus, where laughter was safe. All her husband had to do to keep Apollo's favour was not rape his priestesses or the daughters of his priests. It was laughable in the dark hours of the night, even as she sent messages of condolence by day to the Mycenaeans who wept to discover that their son, their father, their brother had been culled by the archer's arrows. Agamemnon was so magnificently self-absorbed, he could not even see that the simplest abstinence would have kept his men safe. He was like a spoiled child, grabbing at things because he wanted them, with no thought for anyone else, not even a god. The arrogance was remarkable. Some of the men nursed injuries from the Trojan battles, missing limbs, missing eyes, livid purple scars spilled across arms and faces, sores and ulcers wept from wounds which would not heal. Clytemnestra found herself wondering if their wives would want these damaged creatures back. Would she have welcomed home a cripple? She thought for a moment and decided she would not. But still she was sure that she would have preferred any one of these ruined men to her own husband. And in the very center of the group, just behind Agamemnon, surrounded by his men, she saw the priestess. It was all she could do not to laugh. Was this his trophy from the war? While his brother, took Helen, daughter of Zeus and Leda. She was barely more than a child. Though she wore her priestess's robes, the fillets around her hair were waving as she walked. Her mouth moved all the time, Clytemnestra noticed, as though she were muttering words without pause. She was smaller, darker than Iphigenia had been at the same sort of age. Clytemnestra had done this every time she'd seen a girl in the last 10 years. Was she taller or shorter than Iphigenia? With more or less beautiful eyes, did she carry herself with the same poise that Iphigenia always had? Would her skin look as radiant in a saffron gown? Would her hair flow as copiously down her shoulders? Would her feet move as neatly as she danced? Would She drove her fingernails into her palms to break the thought. Iphigenia would not raise, rest uneasy for very much longer. The men came to a halt before her and she bowed again. Husband, welcome home. Clytemnestra, get up, he said. You behave as though I am your barbarian king. Nothing else. No apology. No affection. Nothing. 
There was, Clytemnestra was honest enough to admit to herself, nothing he could have said or done that would have saved him, but it was lazy of him not even to try. As though he wanted to be killed. Or, she considered a second possibility, the gods wanted him to be killed. That was surely it. She stood up and waved her hands at her slave women. Lay the tapestries down, she said. My husband will enter his home on a stream of red, the blood of the barbarians he has crushed. The women surged forward, laying the glistening red tapestries on the ground. What are you doing, woman? Agamemnon looked around him to see if his men were shocked by this fawning display. Their faces remained still and it made him pause. Was it not such a peculiar thing his wife was doing? Only gods would walk on such brocade, he hissed. Men must walk on the sandy earth. You would walk on them if a god ordered it, she said. A silent shudder seemed to pass over them all as though Poseidon had tapped his trident on the ground, feather light. Agamemnon looked at his wife's impassive face to see if she'd intended the meaning that he had just heard. He had sacrificed his daughter because Artemis had ordered it. No one would ever be able to call him impious. He obeyed the gods even when they demanded terrible things of him. Even when they demanded his eldest child, he did not hesitate to do as the priests instructed. It was Zeus's will that Troy should fall. Everyone knew it. And if the price was his daughter, then his only choice was to sacrifice her himself or let someone else do it. He had done the courageous thing. But he found himself wondering if his wife realized that. Perhaps she would have preferred it if some other Argive had taken the knife to the girl. I would do anything the gods ordered, he said, as would all wise men. If the message was given to you by a priest, she said. Again, he searched her face, looking for signs of contempt around her mouth, but her eyes were fixed modestly on the ground and he could see no trace of her feelings. Yes, he answered. The priest, Calchas, had delivered the message that his daughter must be sacrificed. Agamemnon had raged at him, threatened to cut him down or at least lock him up. But Menelaus had reasoned with him, his brother, explained that someone must take the girl's life. He'd even offered to do it himself. Agamemnon still thought well of his brother for that kindness. But in the end, it had not been necessary. And what do you think? Priam would have done in your position, she asked. Priam had never been in his position. The old man had lost his war, lost his city, lost his life, dragged, screaming from an altar, someone had told Agamemnon, pitiful old creature. After all those years of war, Agamemnon thought the Trojan king would have had the courage to die like a warrior instead of crawling on the ground like an insect. He would have marched upon the purple weave, likening himself to the gods, he replied. So Priam did not fear the comparison with a god in the way that you do, she asked. He was an arrogant man. Kings are often arrogant men, Clytemnestra said. It is what reminds the rest of us that they are kings walk on the tapestries now that we have laid them out for you so carefully reward us for our gratitude that you have returned do as we beg of you so we know that you are gracious in your victory as you have never had to be in defeat Agamemnon sighed and looked down at his feet he gestured at the slave women who had placed their beautiful crimson burdens on the ground. 
Not in these old boots at any rate, he said. One of you help me take them off. If I am to walk on the blood of my enemies, I shall do it with my feet bare in honour of the gods. The women looked at their queen. She nodded. They rushed to the feet of their king and unlaced his old leather boots. It was impossible to say what colour they'd once been. Red, brown, tan. The mud of the Trojan peninsula had soaked into them and the sand of the Trojan shore had worn them away. A moment later, the king stood in front of his ancestral palace, in front of his men, in front of his wife, his nut-brown legs ending with strangely pale feet. Like creatures that had only lived in the dark. The king looked down and laughed at the incongruity. There was never a good time to take my boots off in Troy, he said, looking around at his men for agreement. They were beginning to disperse, peeling off from the edges of the Greek group to rejoin their families. Agamemnon gave a small nod to convince himself that it was him granting them permission to leave. Clytemnestra opened her arms and gestured at the carpet. Walk, king, she said. Walk on the blood of your enemies. Trample them into the ground. Walk on the wealth you have won for your house. Walk on the tides of blood which sailed with you back from Troy. Walk. And Agamemnon crossed the crimson ground and disappeared into the palace. You too, Clytemnestra said to the priestess. Come inside. The girl did not respond. The queen turned to one of her maidservants. What did she say? What did he say she was called? He didn't say. Clytemnestra clicked her tongue against her teeth. Not the king, the messenger who told us the king was on his way. The maidservant thought for a moment, but could not find the answer. Go ahead, Clytemnestra said. Heat the water for the king's bath. Yes, madam. The girl ran into the palace. The rest of you, take these inside and place them back where they belong, Clytemnestra said, and don't forget to brush off the dust. The women gathered up their tapestries, shook them gently in the breeze before rolling them up and carrying them indoors. A few people were still milling around outside the palace, but Clytemnestra ignored them. The old men of Mycenae did not know where to go now that their king had returned, but their sons had not. But what could she do to help them? Their loss was no greater than her own. You girl, she spoke to the priestess again. Come on. Cassandra was gazing at the palace roof, an expression of utter horror on her face. Startled, Clytemnestra turned to follow her gaze, but there was nothing there. What can you see? she asked. As she spoke the words, she realised that she could not remember the last time she'd been curious about someone else. She'd wanted to know specific information, of course, not least Agamemnon's whereabouts and his health, but she had no recollection of being interested in anyone else's views on anything for 10 years, at least, perhaps longer. I can see them dancing, Cassandra said quietly. She waited for the slap of her mother that her mother would have given her. But Clytemnestra merely looked again at the roof and then back at the priestess. She didn't seem angry, only intrigued. Who can you see dancing, she asked. Black, three black creatures, black fire licking around them. Why isn't the roof alight? All those black flames kissing it and teasing it. Why doesn't it catch fire? I don't know. The queen replied, why doesn't it catch fire? Cassandra shook her head, chewing at her lips with tiny, frantic bites. 
don't know, don't know, don't know, don't know, she said. Not real fire, must be not real fire. Is it real? Can you see them now? Can you see the women dancing in the fire? Can you hear them screaming? Can you hear the hissing of the flames and the snakes? The queen thought carefully about her next question. Are they screaming because of the fire? No. No, not the fire. The fire doesn't burn them. The fire is them. Do you understand? They are wreathed in fire. They bathe in fire. They do not scream for it. They scream for justice. No, not justice. Uh, that's not right. It's something like justice, but it's stronger. What is it? Cassandra flicked her gaze at the Queen before turning it back to the roof, which still held her attention. Did you say it was black fire? Yes! Yes, yes, yes! Cassandra screamed, black fire! That's it! Can you see it? Knowing this would be her last day, having known that for so long, one thing she never expected to feel was hope. But the sudden sense that someone, someone might be able to see what she could see made her feel it nonetheless. It had been so long since she had been able to share anything with anyone. No, I don't have your gift, the Queen said. But I know what it is that you see. Women wreathed in black fire those are the Furies. Yes! And it is not justice they scream for, she said. It is vengeance. That's it! They scream for vengeance and their snakes are screaming too and their jaws are pulled back and their fangs are bared and you have to give it to them. It is everything! They are waiting for you! They have been waiting for you! They are my daughter's guardians, Clytemnestra said. They have danced around these halls for 10 years. With a knife, oh no. He took her with a knife. Your poor girl, your poor little girl. On her wedding day, she was so happy. And then, your girl at the altar for her wedding. Clytemnestra felt the tears forming. Yes, she said, that's right. He killed my daughter. Did he tell you? That man has no shame. Cassandra shook her head again. Didn't tell, doesn't talk, she said. Never talks to me except to say, be quiet, lie still, stop crying, nothing else. So how do you know? Did the soldiers tell you? She told me, Clytemnestra said. Iphigenia, pretty name, such a pretty name. Pretty name for a pretty girl. Your baby girl, you labored so hard to bring her into the world, so hard. She nearly didn't survive, and you nearly didn't survive, and she was your precious, your precious girl, and he took her. But you will see her again. You will see her sooner than you think, she promises. Her brother and sister promise. The tears streamed down Clytemnestra's face. Of course they do. They will want to avenge their father. Cassandra wrenched her gaze down from the roof and focused on the woman standing before her. Tall, broad-shouldered, handsome and strong. Her hair was streaked with grey and soft lines framed her eyes and her mouth. You believe me, Cassandra asked. No one had believed her for as long as she could remember. Who was this woman who was immune to Apollo's curse? Of course I believe you. I saw him kill her. No one believes me. You can see the past and the future, Clytemnestra asked. Cassandra frowned. 
she'd stopped noticing the difference between those two things so long ago that it seemed peculiar that anyone else should. The Queen seemed to hear her thoughts. Oh, they're the same for you. So you know what, what is coming and yet you do not run away. No, Cassandra said, no point running from what's already happened. But it hasn't already happened, said the Queen. If you ran away now, you might live. You're young. You have quick legs. You could run away down the hill, hide among the trees, wait for a shepherd or someone to find you and make you his bride. Apollo's mind is made up, Cassandra said. It ends today. You will not fight the will of your God. Cassandra removed the priestess's headdress, which she had worn since one of the Mycenaean men had given it to her on the voyage home. He had pinned new ribbons to her hair, not realising that Cassandra knew he had looted them from the temple of Hera in Troy. But she did not complain. She sat patiently muttering while he took the stained ribbons from her headdress and replaced them. He murmured platitudes quietly the whole time as if he was speaking to a wild animal. There, there, he had said, as he stepped back to admire the garland he had rejuvenated. But now she wrenched the pins from her hair. And Clytemnestra was surprised to see that she did not wince. Cassandra dropped the headdress on the ground and placed her very small left foot on top of it. Clytemnestra felt a sudden rush of memory of Iphigenia's beautiful white feet. You spurn your God at last, she said. He's left me, Cassandra replied. He is my God no longer. It was the only explanation for why this queen believed her and why no one else had for so long. Apollo's curse no longer twisted her words on the way out of her mouth. The God was absent. But he would have protected you, Clytemnestra said. But Cassandra laughed. A terrible scratching sound, rusty from disuse. He would have guided your hand, she said. He may still. Take me inside. You have your altar ready. Clytemnestra nodded. All that's needed is the sacrifice, she said. We'll conduct the sacrifice together. Clytemnestra had waited for so long to have her revenge that sometimes... In the darkest hours, she wondered whether killing Agamemnon would be enough. Because then what would she do? She could hardly kill him twice. What if a small voice, a daimonion, spoke in her mind? She looked down upon his corpse and felt no rush of victory. What then would be the force which impelled her forward? but she need not have worried. Killing him was every bit as satisfying as she had hoped. Partly because he had skulked behind a war for 10 years, growing older and more bitter with every passing month, while the men around him died so lightly, he had clung to life. And so she knew, she knew in every part of her mind that she was taking from him something which he valued highly, too highly. She moved quickly through the halls, making sure everything was being done in the right order. She checked his bath was being drawn the way he preferred it, hot, scented, like a temple offering. She took the priestess to the altar room inside the palace and bade her to wait there, and she threw incense on the fire. And the girl, mute again, knelt on the ground before the hearth and mouthed her prayers and prophecies in silence. The sweet smoke almost choked Clytemnestra, but it seemed to make the girl calmer. A priestess was used to burning incense, Clytemnestra supposed. I will return for you, Clytemnestra murmured, but you still have time to flee. But the girl was deaf now as well as mute. And so the queen pulled the curtain across the doorway and left her in her prayer. She walked through to the bath, a huge circular indentation in the floor of the palace. 
the water was streaming, was steaming, and she paused so that her eyes could adjust to the flickering torchlight and the suffocating haze. She could see Agamemnon, pudgy and shrunken, sitting in the middle of the room. She scooped up the purple robe she had woven so carefully for this moment. Here, husband, she called out and walked towards the water's edge. Let us envelop you in purple and take you next door. We will cover you in scented oils and scrape the last remnants of Troy from your skin. You startled me, woman, said the king, as if she hadn't noticed. Can the slaves not bring the oil in here? We have a couch laid out for you, Clytemnestra said, with wine and honey waiting in your cup. The king rolled his eyes gracelessly and stood. He walked up the three small steps from the pool to his wife and reached out his arms and she helped him to place his right arm into the right sleeve and quickly pushed his left arm into the left one before he realised that the robe was no robe but a net, a trap, an ambush. The sleeves had no ends. They were sewn shut and attached to the body of the garment so once his arms were inside them he was pinned. He clutched at the fabric with his fingers, but she had sewn layer after layer into the sleeve ends, so there was nothing that he could grip. And she spun him off balance, and she tied the strings at the back of the robe into a very quick knot. What are you doing? He shouted, angry now, not afraid. Not afraid until he saw the sword glinting in her left hand. He had not noticed a sword propped up against a pillar in its shadow. He did not recognise it. It was a short, womanish weapon. Where could his wife have found such a thing? She drove the sword into his gut, above his paralysed arms, and he screamed. She wrenched it back and drove it in higher, splitting the gap between two of his ribs on the right-hand side. He screamed again and fell forward onto his knees, and she drew the sword out a second time. His screams were deafening, but no one came running to help him. No one came. She stood above him now and drove her sword down through his ribs once more. He felt the air disappear from his lung as she sliced into that too. He opened his mouth to make a sound, but his voice had left him. He looked down to see his innards spilling out onto the ground. The purple of his viscera lost in the purple of the treacherous robe. His widow stood over his body and smiled. Everything was going according to plan. She watched his blood taint the water red. How typical of Agamemnon to despoil something even after death, she thought. She felt warm and flushed with a savage joy, as if she too might dance on the roof, licked by that black fire. But this reminded her that the, her revenge was not complete, and she walked calmly to the altar room. The priestess was still there, kneeling on the floor, calmly awaiting her fate. Clytemnestra hesitated for two beats of her racing heart, but she knew that she had to kill again. Nothing of Agamemnon's could remain except his blood running through her surviving children. Cassandra had foreseen it, and the gods had demanded it. Clytemnestra stood behind the girl and raised her sword to draw it across her neck. She must die, but unlike Agamemnon, there was no need for this girl to suffer. And as she was about to bring the blade across Cassandra's vein, the girl opened her eyes and looked up at her murderer. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry for what will come. 
and in later years, when Clytemnestra thought about this moment, she was always sure it must have been her that spoke these words because what could the priestess have to be sorry for? Up on the palace roof, the Furies ceased their dance. They looked at one another, nodding excitedly. Their work was done, their will had been carried out at last. It was the longest they had ever waited anywhere, dancing through the halls and across the warm stone floors, warming their bare feet and their cool snakes as they went. But after a year or two, they'd grown bored. They'd clambered onto the roof to try and spot the guilty man returning so they could scream into his ears as he woke or tried to sleep and drive him from his senses. They had waited and waited and waited for his return. They did not speak of all the other guilty men who had gone unpunished in the years that they had spent on this roof of the Palace of Mycenae. The Furies would catch up with them soon enough. In this moment, they felt nothing but exuberance at the final settling of matters here. And yet, one of them turned her head as if she'd just caught the edge of a sound but wasn't quite sure. The snakes paused their writhing and the flames shrank away. A second sound, then a third. The Furies said nothing. But then they began to climb down from the roof, all vipers and fire and elbows and knees. Where was it coming from? They scurried along the outer walls of the palace and the sound grew louder. A hammering noise was emanating from the storeroom. The door was made of thick wood, banded with blackened metal, but as they stood outside, they heard someone pounding on the door, begging to be let out. Electra had been locked in there for hours and she was no fool. She knew by now that her father was dead, killed by her mother. Had the slaves told her? Had Agithus? The Furies neither knew nor cared. All they heard was her fists pounding on the locked door and her tears as she begged to be allowed to see her father's corpse. The Furies did not concern themselves with doors or walls. They appeared beside her and wreathed her in their black fire. Their snakes nestled in her hair, and although she could not see the women who encircled her or the snakes which writhed around her, Electra felt their fiery warmth, and she knew what she had to do. She must find her brother find Orestes, and then they must avenge their father. <laughs>